Oh my god. Say there was a disturbance, but everything's under control. Say it, or I will kill you. Without me, you got nobody to fly the plane. I never think that far ahead. And if you say a word about this over the radio, the next wings you see will belong to the flies buzzing over your rotting corpse. Welcome to Con Air. Hey everyone, it's The Boot. Yeah, it's The Boot. We are <laughs> recasting classic movie reboots so Hollywood doesn't have to do it and they probably don't want to. So... We're going to will it into existence, <laughs> speak it into the universe, and it will happen. I'm Brian Flynn, and with me is Kenna Trent. Kenna, how you doing? I love this movie, so I'm oh, very excited to talk about it. I can't it. wait to tear this movie apart. <laughs> it's going to be a fun one, guys. Break out the fine china, chill the lemonade, and tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. This week, we're talking about the 1997 action clusterfuck directed by <laughs> Simon West, entitled Con Air, starring Nicolas Cage... John Malkovich, John Cusack. What a cast! <laughs> kind of this movie had everything. It had inept lawyers, <laughs> it had inept federal agents, inept <laughs> prison guards, a total breakdown of the prison industrial complex, racial stereotypes, homophobic stereotypes, and a super rapey Danny Trejo, which I, I completely <laughs> forgot about. He just like had to rape. It is awful. for like a two hour flight. He was just like. Gotta, gotta rape. So much so that in the massive, like, firefight insanity that happens at that airfield, (laughs) he specifically, like, leaves everybody and is, like, like, Grinch walking back to the plane to try to rape this woman. It is insanity. Guys, if you have kids listening to this one, maybe, maybe put on headphones, maybe skip to the Singing in the Rain one because, I don't know. It's, it's gonna have adult themes. You know what's wild though? I there's so much to talk about and we'll get to it. But what's odd to me is that you say that because this movie came out in 1997 and I was six years old at that time. So when I saw this movie, probably in like the early two thousands, mm-hmm. I was definitely too young to to, to take in this content. And somehow I'm gonna call my father out on this. He thought it was okay. <laughs> And because of that, I just feel like I have fond memories. Well, that's nice. I mean, there's no nudity in it. There's but no it like is, sex in it. It is intense. It's intense. It's intense. Okay, well, before Ken and I get into our reboots, before we get into our top five picks for recasting Con Air into a modern day, we have some real reboot news. Some actual reboots are happening. I mean, they're happening all around us every they're day. Happening? Why didn't <clears throat> anybody tell us? Just kidding. It is in our email inbox every single day of our lives it's like the mail it just keeps coming it's like that part in harry potter where they keep getting the invitation Mm -hmm. to hogwarts Mm -hmm. and his uh aunt and uncle keep like tossing it out like i'm uncle vernon (laughs) (laughs) you're like gremlins reboot no way surf ninjas reboot get out of here what another terminator no that's me. All right, guys. Uh, this week we're talking about 9 to 5. 9 to 5 reboot, punching in. Rashida Jones' to script with Pat Resnick, Dolly Parton, Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, all circling. 20th Century Fox is in the early stages of a new version that would focus on three young women dealing with sexism and chauvinism in the workplace who turn to the original trio for help navigating and getting even with the coarse male higher-ups. Sources said that there are early talks for creator Pat Resnick to team with the young writer. Actress scribe Rashida Jones is the one they want to find a handle that can make the concept relevant to a young comedy audience. The film will be produced by Sean Levy, Resnick, and Jonathan Baruch of Rain Management Group. I watched 9 to 5 just so I could talk about this movie. It was wonderful. I loved every minute of it. Interesting. I would say the dream sequences were a little long, but the comedy... St- I mean, Lily Tomlin has been like one of my favorite comedians my whole life. So anything she does. And Jane Fonda is still crushing it. She's still in like she, yeah. two movies a well, year. Well, both of them. They have they have their own Netflix show. Oh, yeah, that's right. Grace and Frankie. Yeah, I, I, I love, watch the shit out of this. Especially they bring them all back. Yeah, I love everything about what they're saying. Like Because obviously, given the current climate, everything about this movie, it makes so much sense to remake it mm-hmm. right now. Working nine to five. What a way to make 
first day I got here, and I put up with all your pinching and staring and chasing me around the desk because I need this job, but this is the last straw. Look, I got a gun out there in my purse, huh. and up to now I've been forgiven and forgetting because of the way I was brought up, but I tell you one thing, if you ever say another word about me or make another indecent proposal, I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. But I, I, I like that they're taking all the original uh, performers and creators and specifically looking for people to put a modern comedy spin on it. Yeah. That all just, it makes so much sense. And if they're smart about it, I think it could be really fantastic. That doesn't worry you that it might get, because comedy today, it's wildly different than than comedy back then. It, it feels like... Do you think that modern 9 to 5 is like an Amy Schumer R-rated comedy? No. I, what I worry about is more of like a Seth macfarlane of it like and i like um, i like family guy you know well i used to like family guy i don't watch it anymore but you know what i mean the kind of sort of referency humor kenna is like her head is shaking so much she has become she's become the girl from the exorcist <laughs> her head's just like spinning in a no you, but you know what i mean like i don't want to watch that i don't yeah, want to watch no, no, that no. i want to mm-hmm. watch like i want to watch lily tomlin hear a dick joke to herself and be and just sort of <laughs> smile because she gets it and we get it but like the world doesn't really like you don't have to hit it over the head right there could absolutely be subtlety in this i hope who so i'm assuming there's three girls that are gonna be uh, like you think they're gonna mentored they're by gonna, oh okay yeah the three older women one of them is definitely Kristen wig which means mccarthy won't be far behind oh yeah melissa mccarthy is definitely in this movie <laughs> I kind of want to see, um, and maybe like a Leslie Jones. Oh yeah, I was gonna say uh, all all the names are escaping me right now. Um, but fucking describe them. This is charades. Use your words. <laughs> Another SNL alum. <laughs> She's black. She's the funniest woman on planet Earth. Maya Rudolph. Maya Rudolph. Okay. <laughs> Thank God it came back to me. No, she. That's great. That's really great. I would. I just. I need more Maya Rudolph. After the Oscars, I would put. I would put Maya Rudolph and Tiffany Haddish in this movie oh yeah asap yeah this next one isn't really <laughs> it's a not, remake it's not but real but it's it's it hit, fun to talk about it hits social media waves and we kind of wanted to talk about it uh in wake of black panther's success michael b jordan fans want him to star in an anime space jam remake what's funny is that the person who tweeted this out their twitter handle is at brent raptor which i'm assuming is not their real name and i'm hoping is a play on Brett Ratner. Um, But they tweeted, remake Space Jam, but instead of Michael Jordan, it's Michael B. Jordan, and instead of Looney Tunes, it's anime. So I have a question about this remake. I'm all on, I'm fully, I'm ready to buy my ticket. Uh I'm ready to go. Are the Looney Tunes stars drawn in a style of anime, or are they collecting anime? I think they're taking anime characters. Yeah. Cowboy Bebop. Yeah. Ranma one half. Yeah. Neon Genesis. I know a lot of anime. You do. I'm I impressed. know those four anime. I'm, I'm tri- impressed. Trigun. I know zero anime. You know some anime. Like um like Miyazaki oh, is like, is Miyazaki <laughs> anime? I guess. Like Howl's Moving Ca- Howl's Moving Castle and Spirited Away. I'm not I'm not familiar with the world. I think that's the one thing that keeps me if I was an anime fan, I would be like Yes, sign me up. But I think the thing that wouldn't work about this is that you genuinely might alienate some people who love like the idea of the Looney Tunes and just have no accessibility to anime characters. Sure. But if I was to say to a a novice who doesn't know anything about anime Mm -hmm. and I was like, you got to go see this movie. Because it stars Michael B. Jordan, the actor, who is not a professional basketball player, <laughs> sent into an anime realm to play basketball against like anime aliens. Wait, so the plot is still the Plot's same. Plot is still the same. They're still playing an intergalactic <clears throat> right. basketball game. And then I have to be like, Goku from Dragon Ball Z is playing Power Forward. And you would be like, I don't know what any of this means. <laughs> and I'd be like, I know. That's why we have to go see this movie. Get the Quad City DJs on board, and I'm in. Welcome to the space See, this is why we should be movie. If, if we're just going to remake everything, mm-hmm. let's remake things as weird as this. Well, I it mean, would break box office numbers. People would go like this. This movie doesn't make sense, mm-hmm. but it's so interesting to me. Let's take one of the most like 
one of the uh, biggest up and coming celebrities of our time, mm-hmm. put him in a movie that doesn't make any fucking sense, starring all anime characters. <laughs> it's so strange it could work. It's Honestly, it's like chocolate and peanut butter for the first time. You're like, why didn't we think of this? I feel like we should be taking more suggestions from the internet because people come up with wild ideas and I feel like everybody's like, yeah, yeah. And then movie execs are like, no. But like the the um, Rihanna and Lupita Nyong'o uh, project that came about because of a picture they took at a fashion show, like that kind of stuff. Let's... Let's take more suggestions from Twitter. The people cry for what they want. Yeah. They cry out. And this just happens to be a reboot of a beloved classic. <laughs> I think this would make so much money. I, the fact that this isn't greenlit already is insane. Is it problematic to bring R. Kelly back to sing a version of I Believe I Can Fly? Oh, 100,000%. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed. Just have someone else sing a version of it. Just, just have someone write a different, just have John Legend come in and be like, we need an inspirational flying song <laughs> to forget about R. Kelly. Let's get uh, Common and John Legend in here and be like, that's let's. an Oscar winning we, collaboration. Yeah, come on, guys. Okay, so we're going to get into Con Air. I almost said nine to five. <laughs> I think I'd rather talk about <laughs> nine to five. We we're, can't. We we're going to get into Con Air. Uh, Ken and I, we're going to, uh, we've picked five of the main, who we think are the main characters of this mm-hmm. movie. We're going to recast them for a Con Air for 2018. But before we do that, we have some rules. First of all, let's just put this out there. This is a podcast that you are going to want to listen to with IMDb open and right in your face. Open it up right now. Get that app open. Sit there with it at the ready. Your little thumbs on the keypad because there are going to be some faces you want to look up. Also, do yourself a favor and stop us and... Go watch this movie. First of all, because it is just worth your it's time. It's insane. It's worth your time. Or don't watch this movie and watch <laughs> The Rock instead, which is a much better action Which we movie. will definitely be doing at some point. Thank I, God. See, I feel like you're giving The Rock a little too much credit, no, though. because brilliant. Con Air, Con Air is... I, they, on the spectrum of crazy, they're both on it. Mm-hmm. Con Air may be leaning a little more to insanity, but... Um, yeah, go watch this movie or don't watch this movie. Just try to figure out what it is based on how we're talking about it. Uh, that might be fun. Um, okay, so we also have some rules. Three wo- three rules for this podcast. Rules. And why we are here today. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so we have three rules. We've been over this a lot. Hopefully you're listening to us and you've heard this a million billion times. But if you haven't, what? What are you doing on this episode? The first rule is... No remakes, reboots, or long lost sequels. We will not do a movie on this podcast that has already been redone in the last 20 ish years. And this includes franchises that sort of pop back up every once in a while. Star Wars, I'm looking at you. Rule number two our dream cast must be made up of actors that are A, alive, and B, working today. Is there anybody in this movie who's already dead that we can't recast? Because, you know, I love casting somebody who was in the original to be in the remake. I think it's a lot of fun. I, but... I don't want to jinx it. Oh. But I think I think they're all kicking. They're all alive. Good for them. I mean, Nick Cage's career is dead. But... Ooh, holy hot take. Uh, <laughs> poor guy. Rule number three is no Tinder casting. We are not just looking at the way people look. You have to have seen something that they've done. I am. Vouch. <laughs> It's interesting because I don't think there's anybody in the world who looks exactly like Nick Cage, so you can't exactly. We want thespians. Replace, yeah. We want They've thespians. They've got to be people that we that we find uh, talented and attractive. That's who we're looking for. <laughs> That's what it takes in this business. Um, yeah. Great. Okay, guys, this is Con Air. I spoke to your wife in person. In person, and your little girl. You saw Casey. Uh huh. If this thing goes bad, Locke, then I'm afraid my daughter won't understand. If you talk to my wife again, you tell her I love her. She's my hummingbird. But I couldn't leave a fallen man behind. He'll do that for me, won't you, Locke? Sure, I will. What are you going to do for me? What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to save the fucking day. Who are the five characters we're doing? We're doing Cameron Mm Poe, Vince Larkin, 
Cyrus the Virus Grissom, Grissom Diamond Dog, and Garland Green, Correct. the Marietta Mangler. Now, before we get into this movie, we need to talk about <laughs> Nick Cage's southern accent. As oh, a, you know I have a lot to say about this. Do you consider yourself a southerner? Here's what I tell people, because Kentucky, I feel like everybody tends to tell me that it is not a southern state, but we are culturally southern. I think you are southern, yes. because I am culturally northern. Yeah. His uh, accent is awful. Okay, I read... <laughs> I read in the trivia that apparently he went to Alabama to refine his accent. And I don't know who he got a hold of, but it is terrible. It's terrible. It's so distracting. It doesn't, it sounds like generally in movies where people do Southern accents, I get frustrated because I'm like, sure, I know somebody who talks like that, but that's not common. Mm -hmm. In this case, I was like, I know nobody in any Southern state. (laughs) That speaks like this, and it sounds crazy. I can't see my little daughter on her birthday without bringing her a gift now, can I? Yeah, man, but that's a bunny rabbit. That's all right. I mean, she'll like it, right? I mean, what, it's either this or a tube of toothpaste and two packs of palm oils at the canteen. That's a present. (laughs) I'll remember that on your birthday. So this movie was directed by Simon West, who directed The General's Daughter and... Crank, an, a Jason Statham movie, or maybe he did one of the Fast and Furiouses. But no, there's no way he did Fast and Furious. <laughs> so definitive. Sorry. Oh, the, one of the Expendables. The mechanic. He directed ex- the Expendables two. And Wild Card. He has done a lot of Jason Statham. He works. has. Um, I don't know how he let Nick Cage do this accent, and then I then I looked and I was like, oh, I think this is like his first movie. So I think maybe he was like, he don't was scared. Tell. He, he was, was like, scared. don't tell your star. How to he how to act? Nuts! But it's so distracting, and his whole character is insane. The beginning of this movie is literally insane. So Cameron Poe okay. comes out of the army. Yes. He heads home to his pregnant wife, who is a bartender <laughs> and one of the diviest of divey bars. Pause. Pause it. Pregnant wife. I have a question. Mm-hmm. She she is not showing at all, and she's supposed meaning, to be seven months pregnant. Meaning. She she can't be any more than three months pregnant. Who is the father of this child? Right. Because he was in the Marines. Yes. For, I'm assuming, a two-year tour of duty. And then there's a point later where his like daughter's writing a letter and is like, my daddy was went to prison three months before uh-huh. I was born. And I was like, wait a second. I guess the trial took a certain amount of time, but I was like, what is the timeline on this? This know. kid is not his kid. Did you ever suspect that the bar fly, who was the most insulting to our veterans, by the way? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, he deserved. He blamed Nick Cage for <laughs> Vietnam. It's like, the dude was like six. <laughs> what are you talking about? But like, do you think maybe there was some maybe like side action and then... Like that's why he got so violent. Yeah, because he he was like that they had a thing and then Nick Cage comes back and then she's like, she told him maybe like, this can't happen. This was a mistake. Like my husband's home now, which happens in real life. Like people go away and and a lot of... Yeah. I don't know. But uh, (laughs) um, fake baby aside, however the Immaculate Conception happened, that's not even my biggest problem. My biggest problem is the justice system in this universe doesn't make any sense. So a man is taking his pregnant wife home. Mm -hmm. Three hoodlums jump out of what looks like an oil refinery (laughs) next to a bar. That was insane. This was such a good scene. They smash a glass bottle, which is already like an offense. It's It's a a deadly deadly weapon. weapon. Yeah. He defends his wife and in the process kills one of the men. Wait. another Another guy had a knife. Quick question. How does he kill the man? Oh, he does he just punch him in the face? No, he really hard? palm thrusts the man's nose into his brain it's absurd. cavity. It's absurd. Which is like something that I remember learning when I was like on the playground. Like someone was like, you know, if you push a guy's nose into their head, they'll die. And then it's like in this movie, and it's like, it's where real. did you get this from? It's my real. playground? They got it from Con Air. Okay, so then he goes to court and his lawyer's like, just plead guilty. What? On what fucking charge? That public defender, man. Oh my God. It was like the worst law defense I've ever seen. And then the judge hears the case and looks like, hmm, a war veteran 
who has served honorably in our military, gets attacked in at night, mm-hmm. ends up killing a man and decides he's a lethal weapon of his own being and can't yep. be in society. And he has to go to prison. And he has to go to prison? For... Ten years! Yeah. Yeah. Ten years. Yeah. And then it gets worse. So Nick Cage goes into <laughs> the, his cage. <laughs> Nick Cage in his cage. Nick Cage is in the cage. <laughs> and he's like learning all the stuff. He's like hooked on phonics. He's like learning to read as his daughter's learning to read. It's mm-hmm. very sweet. He learned Spanish. He learned Spanish. My wife and I will have our margaritas on the yacht. Mi esposa y yo vamos a tomar unas margaritas en el yate, por favor. He keeps feeding his roommate snowballs. And his roommate turns yeah. out is a diabetic. <laughs> Which is a whole other story. Oh, oh my gosh. And that's literally the first eight minutes my of this fa- movie. My favorite part of this movie is decidedly the portion where he, the, there's a prison riot happening. Things are on fire. People yes. are running amok. Some guy just like runs down the hallway. He is laying in his little cot. He's chilling. Chilling. Good behavior. It's all Hang about that loose. good behavior. Let's get into this. I, I, I have so much more to say, but we're here about the casting. We're here about the 2018 remake. Cameron Poe, uh, all around nice guy, war vet, with a little southern charm. Nick Cage is. If that's what you want to call it. Nick Cage, I mean, he's a tour de force. I don't know what to say. In any movie he's in, it. uh, You can't take your eyes off of him. You can't. I don't. I. I, My my brain is melting even thinking about having to (laughs) recast him. But um, I picked Channing Tatum. From Magic Mike, really 21 Jump choice. Street, really Hail solid Caesar. Choice. He's charming, he's funny, he's a good actor, he's an action star. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I've seen him in many movies where he has a daughter that he has to save or get back to. <laughs> it's a little bit like, did you see Logan Lucky? Yes, I did, yeah. 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 That was cute. Yeah. His little interactions with her, his like weird mm-hmm. accent. Yeah, so I, I just thought it was natural. No, that's a really, really. He's he's bankable. You know, you could you put his name on stuff. Yeah, people see it. Guys, girls. The interesting thing about Channing Tatum, though, is that I feel like he tends to not turn towards. Like he is kind of made to be an action star, and he's really he's a really good actor. Not went in that direction, which no. is good for him to to choose. Because if you watch Step Up, I think one of mm-hmm. his like very first movies, you can tell he's struggling. That this is oh. not, that acting isn't his thing. Yeah. And so I just really appreciate somebody who has honed their craft. Like this is, they, they're not just like getting by on looks and what, whatever got them into the industry initially. Like yeah. he has genuinely become, I think, a really nuanced actor. This insane thought crossed my mind when I was thinking about him for this role. I just kept thinking like, I think. I can envision Channing Tatum winning an Oscar in some like crazy role. Like Nick yeah. Cage won an Oscar for Leaving Las Vegas, and yeah. which is like, if you haven't seen that movie, it's wildly depressing. But he's phenomenal in it, mm-hmm. and I think Channing Tatum might have that kind of potential. Like you give him the right character in the right role. Soderbergh has probably created him. Yeah. To in in all respects, like Soderbergh probably molded him into that actor that you see now. Mm-hmm. So it was just like a weird thought, like. Yeah, I, I I believe in Channing Tatum. I should make shirts that say I believe in Channing Tatum. But I do. I really think that like, <laughs> which is hard for an action star, for an action movie. Mm-hmm. Like you can't just have, you know, a guy who's like all muscles and like no charisma and yeah. no depth because no one's going to care. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my pick. Which is why Vin Diesel's so successful. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, I feel like I kind of have to eat my words about the actor that I chose. Let's let's go. Let's hear it. You're gonna laugh at me. I picked Taylor Kitsch. I am vindicated. <laughs> I am vindicated. I I wrote. Some... Explain yourself. For those of you who don't know. I have almost cast Taylor Kitsch in many an episode to the bewilderment of Kenna. Just like the looks, the comments, how the mighty have fallen. Whoa. (laughs) Brian got ahead of himself a little bit. Um, Okay. I wrote wrote names of people that I 
really like. And then you pick someone that you didn't like. <laughs> but then I did that thing where I was like, man, do I want to spend these actors on this movie? <laughs> You have to. You kind of have to because this movie's so ridiculous that if you don't bring it, it kind of sinks into a B movie. Put the bunny back in the box. I knew you was a punk. And I was right. You've been playing us all along. You a free man. I said, put the bunny back in the box. And I was literally watching the finale of Paramount networks limited series waco as i was going through some choices Mm -hmm. and i just kept looking at him like he is the right choice i can't say that i i love him but he's the right choice it just makes sense all i'm gonna say is texas forever (laughs) i'm with you i i have i have you know me i of course i love this pick there's nothing else to talk about. I'm going to let you sit in your shame for a little bit. I got to move the mic down because I've sunken. <laughs> I, that's the thing. I feel like Taylor Kitsch should be better than he is. And I don't know what is going on. He should have been there was a Channing promise. Tatum. There was a promise in his career, I think. And everybody was like, this kid's going to be huge. And I, given what he's been doing, I can see him as a really solid character actor yeah never quite hitting like movie star status which is but, weird yeah because i think like everybody saw that coming didn't happen but this is his play mm-hmm. i think something like this is this is his chance to star in a movie do you think he'd do a movie like this again or do you think he's like i'm no way i've done it three times and they've all fallen i i just want to stick to my tiny little indie movies just build myself do you think back sometimes up? he calls his therapist and is like they promised me john carter was gonna be good i would <laughs> hell yeah and now they're making a gambit movie and i'm not in it starring channing, channing tatum. tatum yep let's move on to vince larkin why don't you go first Can I just say that the thing I love most about this character is, one, his sandals are featured as if they're a character of their own. And two, everybody he works with hates him. (laughs) They hate his guts. I hate his guts. Everybody's like, he's so incompetent. Like, what an an idiot. And I'm like, really? (laughs) He kind of isn't. I, I mean, he's not incompetent, but he's also, like, the only one to, like, piece this together, which is, I just don't understand this universe. Like, the law in this world doesn't make sense to like me. he's like we have a guy on the inside he's communicating with me and he's gonna help us bring right. the plane in and everybody's like no that's wrong we're not doing that let's shoot the plane out of the sky regarding the sandals that's like supposed to be some weird character choice that like he's supposed to be like this hippie love child or something the what? fact that he like well when well, do we find that out he's called like what's his name calls him that the uh, the the DEA agent calls him that because he wears sandals or something. It's like the guy's wearing like a linen suit. Like <laughs> this character's all over the map. Great late nineties costume choice. So like, this character's all over the map. He's like swimming in this suit. Okay, so I I actually considered gender swapping this role and ultimately could not find a person that felt really, right. That, yeah. There yeah. was I, I looked at a lot of people and I was like, maybe I'm doing this a little arbitrarily and um Ultimately, I wrote one name down for this because when I found him, I was like, this is it. This is the person that I want to see do this. And it is Keegan-Michael Key. Wow. That's interesting. And not in the way that you say that's interesting. I actually think it's interesting. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I'm trying. Okay. So I'm trying to wrap my head around Keegan-Michael Key as he's not a D. Is he FBI? He's FBI. Okay. If you don't know who Keegan Michael Key is, he is one half of now defunct comedy duo Key and Peel, mm-hmm. the one that didn't win an Oscar. He's in Don't Think Twice. Mm-hmm. Oh, come on. <laughs> he's fantastic. Yeah, though. he's fantastic. He's really funny, and I think he's the one. I think like Jordan Peel has said, like he just doesn't want to do like comedy. He doesn't want to do that kind of like yeah. performance anymore. And I, yeah. I would hope that that Keegan Michael Key would not do that because I think he's super funny and he is transformative. Like he can really become so many things. I can definitely see him as that character who's frustrated that no one is following along with what he gets. You know what I mean? And would add some genuine, because I feel like what this movie is missing is Mm self-awareness. And I think if this 
FBI agent who is constantly being told that he is wrong and that he's doing his job poorly. Yeah. Like if we had somebody who could sort of like wink to the audience every once in a while, that would really help us get along in the world. Turn around. Plane's headed to Lerner Airfield. It's a small strip about 100 miles from here. Oh, shit. We're tailing the transponder tag into Arizona. Listen to me. A body fell from the sky. It had a note on it. We got him vectored at 12 o'clock and 30 miles. Vince, please. Scott, we're right on his tail. Just listen to me. It was to me. The note on the body was to me. You're chasing oh, the shut room. up. Hello? Yeah. No, I, I like the pick. I want to see Keegan Michael Key in a lot more stuff. Me too. Um, I picked an actor who has been around for a little bit. I, I picked someone who's a little younger uh, because I sort of saw Larkin as the, the reason why no one. It was like it was the reason why no one is listening to him because he's so young. I hmm. I, I, I didn't know if that was. He is like in, the youngest person in the cast. He is, but they don't specifically say that like he's like mm-hmm. a rookie or anything like that. But I, I got this impression that it was like his first flight with all these convicts. Hmm. So I was trying to pick someone who who could probably play like out of their depth a little bit, or like someone who could who could just sort of feel the stress of maybe being in over his head. I picked Dev Patel from Lion, Slumdog Millionaire, and also from the hmm. newsroom. Two newsrooms in two weeks. Look at that. I have you seen the newsroom since last podcast? Yeah, I went home and oh, I watched, watched it? the whole thing. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, um, I just, I like him as an actor. I think he, you know, because Larkin has to like chase. He's basically chasing this plane all around. Yeah. And I keep thinking that Poe and Larkin have a very brief chemistry together, and mm-hmm. Channing Tatum and Dev Patel kind of struck me as. Two people that might never be in a movie together. So I just thought that might be interesting to have them in this weird scenario and this even weirder action movie. Yeah, I really like Dev Patel as a performer. I think I think he's got some range. Yeah. Like you've got, you know, Academy Award winning film Dev Patel and you've yeah. got the best exotic Marigold Hotel Dev Patel. <laughs> Like yeah, he, put him in an action movie. He, I feel like he the the opportunity he hasn't yet had is an action movie, and I think he'd kill it. I think he'd kill it. That's too. a really good choice. Thank you. All right, let's move on to Cyrus the Virus, who I, I was rooting for basically by the halfway point. I was like, I hope this guy gets to Mexico because I can't stand anyone else in this movie. <laughs> John Malkovich was incredible in this movie. by himself. I thought, and Ving Rhames too. I also, I also, mm-hmm. it was weird. I was just like, yeah, I was so anti this movie. <laughs> I watched this movie twice because the first time I wa- rewatched it, I was like, this can't be this movie. <laughs> Did I get some weird bootleg yeah, of this movie? Yeah, and then the second time I watched it, I was like this angry blogger writing down all of this stuff about just how offensive this movie was mm. and a lot of stuff. Do like, you know what's really Sally interesting? Sally Can't Dance was like, ooh, I was like, ooh, this ooh. really doesn't work, ooh. guys. Um, the interesting thing about this movie is that somebody, a stunt coordinator died making this movie i read that someone gave their life for this movie to be made oh my god that's so sad i'm so sorry (laughs) it's awful awful. i don't know why i'm laughing yeah it's really bad do i go first yes you do okay so john malkovich is incredible in this movie he's my Mm -hmm. favorite part in this movie he Mm -hmm. is somehow like this crazy psychotic or sociopathic villain while also kind of being charming and funny and um, so I try to pick someone who's maybe played a similar role. I picked Michael Fassbender. What? Because, you know, Magneto. He was, a, if you don't know Michael Fassbender, he was in <laughs> Glorious Bastards, what? Steve Jobs. What? Are you not in on Michael Fassbender? Michael Fassbender. Yeah, I need to elevate huh. this fucking movie. Huh. Do you, are you not in on Fassbender? As an act, just I'm like in, trying, in general? I'm trying to envision... <laughs> What this movie, what your movie is in my head. Channing Tatum. It's just as insane as the movie that hmm. was made. Hmm. I mean, I, I love Michael Fassbender, but wow. Just the scene when he's like on the radio talking to Larkin and uh, Malloy. Is mm-hmm. it Malloy or, or Mallory? Ma- M- Malloy? Malloy. Oh, because Interview with the Vampire was old. I was going to say, where have I heard that name before? Yeah. When he's on the radio with Larkin and Malloy, just sort of taunting him. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I think I think Fassbender could kind of get crazy with it. Here are the rules. First, I ask a question, then you ask a question. Okay. What's your question? In Carson City, your bulls were on to us. How? One of the guards 
One of the guards. One of the guards faked a heart attack and we had to remove his restraints. All right? I see. And what's your question? Where are you going with my plane, Cyrus? We're going to Disneyland. You're lying, Cyrus. So are you, Vince. Oh, nothing makes me sadder than the agent lost his bladder in the airplane. His whole character is supposed to be this, like, weird sociopathic. Yeah, he's done it all. American psycho. Yeah. And he's, like, a domestic terrorist, but also a bank robber and also, like, a, a drug runner. So just give it to an actor who's very good. That's the only thing I could think of. It's just like just give it to a really good actor who's not afraid to toe to dip his toes in in the action world. And I'd pick Fastbender, and I think he would play a very compelling villain to hmm. Channing Tatum's stupid yokel marine <laughs> that we all, we all have to watch for like two hours. <laughs> God, I wish this was The Rock. I just wish this was The Rock. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Um. Because now that it. now that we've like broken, <laughs> we've broken the Nick Cage barrier. We're diving in. It's six six weeks straight of Nick Cage remakes. We're doing Vampire's Kiss after this, guys. <laughs> Who'd you got? Okay, I'm I'm really taken aback by Fassie, but well, explain why. Like, wh- oh, how do you uh, see Cyrus then? How how is it different from? I think I just don't think to put as serious of an actor into the part. <laughs> You were, you're trying to like skew this movie <laughs> out of the box office. Like your goal is like two thousand. I'm theaters. trying to make it. My goal is like five thousand theaters. Like let's get this movie. Yeah, Fastbender sells the- movies. Everybody saw the Snowman. <laughs> Sorry, that was rude, but it's also true. Okay, I I think what I think what it is is that even though according to all reports, John Malkovich hated making this movie. That I would like to see somebody who could potentially have a lot of fun doing it. And and I think I just see Michael Fassbender as someone who would take it very seriously. Mm. And you cannot take this movie seriously. Mm. So um, I picked for Cyrus, Jimmy Simpson. I like that pick. Who you may have seen recently in a really incredible episode of Black Mirror. He... <laughs> More recently, Westworld, and no, for you comedy guys, he's no, also in more recently Black Mirror. Okay, well, but also Westworld, Westworld, and Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Always Sunny. He was in of House McCoyle of Cards twins. for yes, a little while. Yes. I love he, Jimmy Simpson. He's awesome, and I could see him. I could see him being a little more wacky, maybe, which yeah. in an odd way I think Malkovich brings to the character, and that's something that I really wanted to capture with my choice. I, I he's an incredible actor. Jimmy Simpson. Yeah, and I mean, he's I, very good. And I feel like his day is is now. You know, yeah. we're in the age of Jimmy Simpson, and I and I hope I hope he comes back for season two. I won't spoil why he wouldn't come back for season two of Westworld if you haven't seen it. But he played a, a he usually plays like creeps and weirdos, and then in Westworld he kind of played. Mm-hmm. He was like a nice guy. Yeah, he was like the yeah. But then stuff happens. But <clears throat> yeah, I, I love the pick. Yeah, no, he's he's the one. I'm trying to envision your cast, and it's just as crazy as my cast. <laughs> Taylor crazy Kitsch, Keegan Michael Key, and Jimmy Simpson. <laughs> crazy in a different way. I mean, that's insane. <laughs> Mine doesn't seem as insane. I, I feel like. Okay. Okay, we're moving on to Diamond Dog, played by Ving Rhames, the militant sort of uh, African American prisoner who's. I think he was on his way to like start a black nation, right? Like that was yeah, his like dream. Is they to... refer to him as a black supremacist, which I had to look up because I was like, is that a real thing? Apparently, it is. Hmm. But yeah, they, then they talk about what's interesting about the characters, and they talk about how in prison, uh, he is he the one that is like was interviewed by Geraldo, mm-hmm. which classic 1997 movie reference. Uh, he's like written books. He's been interviewed for TV. The book is being optioned. Yeah. Yeah. So on your mind, hillbilly. What was I thinking about? Oh yeah, yeehaw, that's right. I was just wondering what a black militant uh, that would be you was doing taking orders from a white boy on a power trip. Don't you think that's strange? It's a means to an end, my white friend. A means to an end. And then the day of the dog begins. He's like a successful guy, which I thought was kind of funny for, uh... but like, I don't remember any of the crimes that he committed. Mm -mm. They don't really announce like what he did. I don't know if he's like killed people or. I mean, I I guess. I don't know. I'm assuming he's one of the ones that they like lock up. Yeah, he's like also a serious bad guy. Um, I think you're up. 
Oh, I am up. I picked Chad Coleman, um, who you might have to look up. I know him most recently because he played Tyrese on The Walking Dead. Okay. You might know him from The Wire. I've never seen The Wire, but from what I hear, it is the best show ever to happen to television. I can't say that that's true, Mm -hmm. but uh, that's what people say. I have also not seen The Wire. Let's make that a project for ours to see The Wire because there's so many untapped actors in there. That's true. I definitely, when I was looking through the IMDb mm-hmm. of The Wire, I was like, wow, wow, wow. All these people came from, came from came this. Came from The Wire. Um, so I can't speak on your pick, but uh, you know, if he's in The Wire, I'm assuming I, he's incredible. I like, feel like incredible. he is one of the characters that there is no, there's no like comedy to him. There's yeah. no, he's, he is uh, intimidating and, but he's not like all muscle. Like he must be however much we disagree with whatever he's talking about, he must be an intellectual to a certain degree. And so, um, yeah, I was just like, who, who out there do I feel like can be as intimidating as they are, uh, knowledgeable. It's weird. Like, I feel like we take Ving Rhames for granted as an actor because Mm -hmm. he's so charismatic in a lot of movies that he's in. Mm Mm-hmm. That we forget that he's hard to kind of replace. Yeah. There's like a, a genuinely a certain quality to him. Because was it what is he doing now? He's in a mission mission he's impossible. He's still in the mission series, impossible, yeah. Which he's is so there. cool. Yeah. It's crazy. He's survived all six. Yep. Him and Ethan. <laughs> um <laughs> so I went with a younger, fresh face. I mean, right off the heels of the scorching success of Black Panther. I picked Winston Duke. Ooh, that's a really M'Baku good choice. Of the I mean, he is tribe. genuinely about to explode. He was incredible. He's fantastic. He was so good. Like I can absolutely see people snatching him. He's going to be everywhere, yeah, and I for want. Sure. I want to. I want to buy in on Winston Duke. I want to be. I want to be on the bandwagon. I want to be where he goes. I want to go with him. I want to ride it. I'll ride his rocket all the way to the moon. That sounded weird. <laughs> sounded really gross. But you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm... Not if that's what you want. <laughs> I, th- I just, I just, see, I think um, he's going to be a big Yeah, star. I agree. I think he is going to be a big and star. And so, what bigger vehicle for him than this remake <laughs> of this remake of atrocious Air. movie that I had to watch? Can I ask you a question about this movie and we'll move on? Yeah. Um, so, we haven't talked about Malloy, the DEA agent who um, kind of is the foil to Larkin. Yeah. He's a horrible character. <laughs> He's a horrible character. So just a real quick background of it. There's this DEA agent who sends his partner on the on the um, oh, flight yeah. to kind of suss out this other criminal who's like running drugs through Latin America. And shit goes crazy and the DEA agent reveals himself to stop the hijacking of the plane by Cyrus and he ends up dead. Who the fuck are you? I'm DEA, that's who the fuck I am. You're DEA, what are you doing on this flight? Won't they fly you boys commercially? Don't push me, Cyrus, man. I swear to God, I'll blow away your little boyfriend right now. I think you should just stop. Stay back, man. Stay back! Just stop right before somebody gets killed. Back! All right, cowboy, I'm back. Stay back! You know you're in a situation you can't control, right? I can't control it? I can't control it? You did me. Shut the fuck up! Which, that is all problematic because he, like, is this man not trained at all? He, again, the dumbest people running this operation. They did not seek expert help on any of this. They were just like, this is how it works, right? People go to court, he murdered someone, he's going to jail forever. So I kept getting this <laughs> exactly. Like, there's no sympathy for any of these people. Even when they bring up Poe, he's just like, fuck that guy. He's an animal. These people are yeah. disgusting. Kill them all. <laughs> it's like, yo. It's so weird. So weird. Um, But did you kind of feel like there was a weird romantic subtext between S- Malloy and Sims he put on the plane? Because... <laughs> When Sim, when Malloy is feeding him the gun, there's like a slow motion shot of them saying goodbye, and like Sim like turns around and like gives him a look, oh. and then hmm. like he was like real thorough when he was like pretending to pat him down, like when he was like <laughs> doing this the body okay. search, and then when Malloy finds out Sims died, he takes like a real long moment, and it could just be like oh they're partners, you know. Uh, in the agency, but like yeah. he took a he took it like a real hard like this the kind of the music that's playing is almost like 
there's something there. I think there's something. Maybe not, but I'm gonna live in a world where they definitely were lovers, <laughs> and Malloy got his partner in 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 his private life, <gasps> and also in his work life <gasps> killed. Ooh. That's why it means so much. That's why he mm. wants to shoot this plane down so badly. It never made sense. It's just like don't they'll run honestly, out of gas. Yeah, just honestly, follow them until they run out of gas, and then have like that motivation <laughs> is not super clear. But under this umbrella that you're creating, under this subtext it's the only it thing makes that makes a lot sense. of sense <clears throat> um but we're not casting malloy we're casting garland green no you specifically said we couldn't i asked because i don't want to i don't care about him the only character i, I care about in this movie is cyrus the virus and garland green what played by what? steve buscemi what about what i want <laughs> so we're moving on we're moving to on to garland green <laughs> garland green um played by steve buscemi who he's a show stealer here he's just Comes in halfway in the plane, and it's just funny that they bring on this villain who's supposed to be like worse than Cyrus, and he yeah he's yeah. like covered in uh, all sorts of shackles it's like the Hannibal Lecter yeah it's like Hannibal Lecter Ted Bundy and Ed Gein all rolled into one and then as soon as they get him on the on the plane he's a real nice guy <laughs> I really loved this there's a real like Frankenstein moment with him and that little girl where you're like he's gonna murder this child. <laughs> Are you sick? Why do you ask? You look sick. I am sick. You take medicine? There is no medicine for what I have. And you're just like sitting there waiting for it to happen. And they sing that creepy song. Yeah. I have a question for you. Okay. Is that girl real? <laughs> That's insane. Or is it all in Garland's head? Um, this movie is not smart enough to accomplish something like that. That girl is definitely real. Well, then where are her parents? Well, obviously she's like a like a like a wretch. Like yeah. <laughs> her she's like a trailer probably, trash. She's probably orphan. strung out. Yeah, but no one speaks to her other than him. The only time because she's seen without him nowhere. is when he first sees her, and then when the plane flies over, she like waves. Yeah. So it's like I guess she's out of the plane. But I still believe that like Garland just made her up. In her head, in his head, and the only reason they show her after is to answer the question whether or not he kills her. He doesn't kill her yeah. because she's not real; she's a figment in the hmm. desert. That's what I believe. Okay. <laughs> For Garland Green, I think you're gonna like this pick. Oh, okay. I picked Jimmy Simpson. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. So there you go. If you don't know who Jimmy Simpson is, rewind this podcast about ten minutes. We just talked about him. We just talked about him. How fun! I just like I. I think he could play like the intelligent warmth of this weird psycho serial killer, which is also very similar to Cyrus. So I understand why you picked him. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of like he's got to be silently weird because he doesn't really talk much. He has the great quip about uh, the irony of dancing to a Leonard Skinner song on a on a plane. Yeah. Define irony. Bunch of idiots dancing on a plane to a song made famous by a band that died in a plane crash. But um, otherwise, yeah, he's just not, he's got to just be weird. So, yeah, obviously, I think Jimmy Simpson's great. Um, what you got? I think I went, a l- I went a little weird, but I really believe in this. I picked Will Forte. That's awesome. That's an awesome pick. That's incredible. Uh, I have nothing bad to say about that. Great. Yeah, there's some... Will like, Forte, uh, Last Man on Earth, SNL, MacGruber, I don't know what else. I mean, he's, young people know who he is. Yeah. Older people might not, but check yeah, him yeah. out. If, yeah, if, you've, if you watched SNL in like the, uh, the aughts, mm-hmm. you definitely know. Yeah, that's is. a really good pick. Um, yeah, I love him. I feel like... He was always just sort of odd on SNL, and I really enjoyed that. But Last Man on Earth, uh, which is the show he created, is so wacky. It's insane. And I just, I think about it, and I'm like, give this man a choice to, like, play an actual serial killer and just see what you would get. I, I would watch the shit out of it. I now want to watch your version because of the <laughs> Will Forte. I think it would be great. We did it. We did our five. So it's now time for our favorite segment. Where does Barry Pepper go? So real quickly, Ken and I will take our favorite character actor, Barry Pepper. We'll stick him in this movie because he deserves to be in every movie. And like we said earlier, this is a podcast best with an open IMDb page. So if you don't know who he is, just IMDb him. And you'll be like, oh, yeah, 
that guy. I love him. So this is definitely like Tumblr fodder. <laughs> There's a Tumblr page called "Why Is It Barry Pepper in Every Movie." <laughs> Um, it's just romantic gifts of him, like putting on a jacket. <laughs> um, oh, do you want me? Yeah, I want to you to go, go first. I want you to go, and I want us to have the same guy. Because come on, it's been a while since we've had the same pick. <laughs> we did. Uh, we did sort of an interesting one um, this time. I went with, and this is sort of wacky. I feel like I'm reconsidering it because I picked something very, again, very bit party. But what if he was the guy who like. Is like running away from the airfield. Oh uh, yeah, that they like yeah. scare off. Yeah, and then later you see him in the desert, and he's just like, Ooh, "I'm gonna die." Uh, I also picked him for uh, a bit part. I picked him as the the driver in the car who gets bird pooped on his car, and then the dead body, and then oh, Dave Chappelle. Well, now look at this walking penis boy. You are one skinny Negro. Easy man. Open shit. up. Oh man, it smells like so much shit in your mouth. You told me you loved me. <laughs> Two in a row. Dave Chappelle is in this movie. Two in a row with Dave Chappelle. <laughs> and Dave Chappelle's body just like crashes on his car. Which is interesting that you say that because the man driving the car is uh, Don Davis of mm. Twin Peaks and oh. Stargate yeah, SG1 yeah, 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 fame. Yeah, yeah. Come on, General Hammond. <laughs> I think that's really inspired. Guys, we did it. We got through it. Yeah. Uh, Kenna, any last bits about this movie before we head off? I'll say this. Before I... we land this bird on the Vegas Strip. Oh, boy. I believe it or not, I fell asleep during that entire portion. The first time I watched this movie, a friend of mine had a really great line. He's like, "Did you think a movie called Con Air would end up in a fire truck chase on the streets of Las Vegas?" And I was like, "No, no, no they definitely that had that had that in their back pocket." Um, I wish every movie was shot like this movie. It's crazy how this is not a Michael Bay movie. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's there really are some weird. hero shots of Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Oh, the the shot where he walks off the plane and it's like he's never he's never felt the wind on his face ever. <laughs> I know. I was like, like chill. maybe he just never went to the yard in prison. <laughs> he just stayed in the cell. Yeah, he he was trying to get those good behavior points. Um, a couple things. Is that how diabetes works? Like when baby O's on the plane and they can't move him? Like I don't think that's how that right. Like he's like, I have to have my shot. Or else I'm just not gonna make it. Yeah, and then I he can't move. I don't think that's how diabetes works. I'm but not I could a be doctor. Wrong. You're not a doctor. No, no, no. But neither was the screenwriter for sure. <laughs> um, and this lastly, person didn't know anything about, as we've established, medicine, lastly, law, the justice system whatsoever. They don't give police a work. Fuck. I'm or surprised even plane. the plane flew <laughs> at the right altitude. Um, and the last but not least, the movie ends with like a funny scene with a mass murder on the loose in one of the most major American cities. And we're all supposed to be like, cool, because he's like super funny and nice. The dude wore a woman's head, like a hat, yes, across state that's lines. That's what they say. Uh, it, it was just like the worst, like, lull moment in a movie. I feel God, like I wish this was The Rock. The one thing we haven't discussed is uh, one of my favorite topics, which is uh, the song that was written specifically for this movie. Oh, God. Listen. Oh, God. National <sighs> treasure, Trisha Yearwood, married to even bigger national treasure, Garth Brooks. You cannot tell me that this is a bad song. You cannot tell me that it's, it's inappropriate for this movie. You cannot convince me. The song in question, everyone, is How Would I Live... How do I live? How do I live? And it's probably playing right now. <laughs> yep. And it was specifically written for this movie. Yeah, it's the romantic theme of Con Air. Oh, my God. A movie that desperately needed a romantic theme. Oh, my God. Theme. What is the tone of this movie <laughs> other than monkey shit on a wall? It's definitely a comedy, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Because that's how I watched it. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Boot. Uh, if you liked us, please subscribe. Please rate. Can I, how can they do that? How can they find this pod? You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or really wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for us. We're out there. You can find the podcast on social media at The Boot Podcast on Twitter and at Boot Podcast on Instagram. Lots of fun stuff going on over there. We are on social media. Who would have thunk it? A couple of millennials like us <laughs> at Flynn B for Bry Guy over here and That's at Kenna Trent for me. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. How do I get through one night without you? If 